Yo, yeah, what's up guys? Welcome to Digital Arts USMLE. So today we're going to cover the Caucus monster, aka Streptococcus viridans. So Streptococcus viridans is actually composed of a group of Streptococcus organisms. But for our sake, we only need to know four, and just the basics for each of them. We will begin by covering the organisms that compose the Streptococci viridans group, their characteristics, their virulence factors, the organ systems affected by them, and the treatment options based on the type of infection. And while we're at it, we can also cover some of the mechanisms of actions or some of the antibiotics we can use against it. So what are the Streptococcus viridans organisms? They are gram-positive and facultative anaerobes, so they normally use oxygen, but they can survive without it. It's catalyst negative, so it can't break down hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. And this test is just used to distinguish Staphylococcus from Streptococcus organisms. We can then use the bile esculin auger, aka BEA, which differentiates Streptococci from Enterococci organisms. Bile esculin auger contains 4% bile, which inhibits the growth of most organisms. Along with glycoside esculin, which is just a sugar, and ferric citrate, if the bacteria can break down glycoside esculin into esculetin and dextrose, then we can detect it because the esculetin will react with the ferric citrate to produce a charcoal type black color. So in this case, Streptococcus viridans won't get raped in the bile. But in the setting of bile, it can't break down the sugar, so it's BEA negative, and we won't see that charcoal black color. Under the microscope, after staining, it looks like a chain of lancet shaped diplococci, so basically a bunch of balls attached like in a line. They can be longer, but they usually don't get too long. It is also alpha hemolytic, which means it's oxidizing the heme groups in the blood, and this is making the agar look green, so you can see that in the picture. We eventually need to distinguish Streptococcus pneumonia from the Viridan Streptococci, and we can do this with the Optocean susceptibility test. Optocean is just a toxic chemical, and it can easily rape Streptococcus pneumonia, compared to the other Streptococci species. So with Strep Viridans, it's resistant, aka not susceptible, to Optocean, and so it will grow. And we know this because we can see that there's no zone of inhibition surrounding the paper Optocean disc. There's also another test called the Lancefield Grouping Test, which groups bacteria from a category of A through S based on the type of carbohydrate composition of the bacterial antigens that are found on their cell walls. For Streptococcus viridans, it is Lancefield detectable, so that's about all we need to know, just for the exams. And just for the crawling test, these organisms will show up as negative because they have no capsule, unlike Streptococcus pneumoniae. So what organisms make up the viridam Streptococci group? There are four big ones and they're pretty hard to remember. Get it? They're big and they're hard? No? Okay, never mind. And they are Strep Sanguis, Strep Bovis, Strep Midas, and Streptococcus mutans. So all four of these organisms may not have a capsule, but they are able to produce biofilms. And biofilms are just when the bacteria start to aggregate, and they're surrounded by a protective coating of DNA, proteins, and polysaccharides, which pretty much produces the slime. They do this by a chemical process called quorum sensing, so the bacteria are like, you guys. Um, if we want to survive, we should probably make some slime. Another virulence factor is dextran. So dextran is just an insoluble sugar. It allows the bacteria to stick onto surfaces. And this is a big problem because it allows them to attach onto platelet fiber aggregates and stick onto the valves of the heart. So yeah, they can cause like endocarditis. So Streptococcus bovis is probably the most high yield. It's known to cause subacute endocarditis, not acute endocarditis, which comes from Staphylococcus aureus and it also causes colon cancer. Subacute endocarditis can only happen with a damaged valve or a prosthetic valve, and the onset is usually slower. It uses its virulence factors, like dextran, to attach onto the damaged heart valve. So on presentation, they will have a murmur from the valve destruction and turbulent flow, and a low-grade fever, along with systemic weakness. Just make sure to check their hands, feet, and eyes on the physical exam as well. You might see some Osler nodes, which are like these small nodules that are pretty painful to touch, and they can be on the fingers or the toes. They may also have these things called Janeway lesions, which are non-tender dark spots on their palms. Also, check the retina for rot spots. Just remember R for retina and R for rot spots. And it's basically a retinal hemorrhage, 
You'll see this on the fundoscopic exam. And check their nail beds for splinter hemorrhages as well. These are basically coming from the microembolization of the vegetations that are being produced. Just remember, the microembolization can cause ischemia and pain pretty much anywhere in the body. Plus these patients are at risk for stroke, so yeah, it can get pretty bad. So normally Streptococcus bovis is part of our normal flora in our GI tract. But if the patient has bacteremia and we see Streptococcus bovis growing in blood cultures, then we need to do a colonoscopy because Strep bovis has a very high association with colorectal cancer. So you want to make sure that there's no polyps or abnormas when you check down there. So next is Streptococcus mutans. It's also known to cause dental caries, especially to those people who don't brush their teeth. It causes this pretty much by gluing onto the tooth with the help of the sticky sugars and carbs we eat. They help pretty much build the biofilm as well. After this point, it starts to eat away the sugar and they start producing waste at the same time. And their waste is pretty acidic and that acid builds up over time and it pretty much just starts to erode and eat away at the tooth. So yeah, this is how it damages your teeth. So yeah, just make sure to brush your teeth. Otherwise, you'll never get laid. So next up is Strep sanguis. So like the other bear dance organisms, they live in our mouths normally. And that ends up being a big problem for people undergoing invasive dental procedures or dental surgery. So Strep sanguis can also cause subacute endocarditis in individuals with damaged valves because it can enter into the bloodstream from the dental procedures and travel all the way down to the heart. Just remember that endocarditis is always a serious case and without treatment, it's 100% fatal. So just remember for any sort of case of endocarditis, you'll need at least three blood cultures to find out the organism. So finally, we come to Streptococcus mitis. It's part of our normal flora and lives on the hard surfaces of our mouth, like our teeth. It can also cause subacute endocarditis as well from invasive dental procedures. And that's pretty much all you need to know about this organism. So at this point, you may be getting confused about acute and subacute endocarditis along with the risk factors. So all you have to know is where do the bacteria normally live in our body? So if it's on our skin, then you're going to think Staphylococcus because Staphylococcus normally lives over there. And you're going to have to worry about this in IV drug users because they're going to break their skin and shove the bacteria into their bloodstream. For our mouths, we have to worry about other organisms like the bear dance species because they normally live in our mouths. So, you know, if someone's drilling holes in our mouths or if we're getting like a dental procedure, then we have to worry about them entering into our bloodstream. So hopefully this should help out. So you want to treat them with a combination of vancomycin, or in the case of strep dance, you can use penicillin G, with rifampin or aminoglycosides like gentamicin, tobramycin, or amikacin initially while you're waiting back for sensitivities. So rifampin just inhibits DNA-dependent RNA polymerase, specifically the bacterial RNA polymerase. It can turn your body fluids orange, but you mainly want to check their liver function test because it can damage the liver. Aminoglycosides are used to cover gram negatives, so they just inhibit the protein synthesis and they script the elongation process at the 30S ribosomal subunit. So the mRNA translation is read wrong and the protein turns out all screwed up. So yeah. Finally, we end with endocarditis prophylaxis treatment. So in order to do this, all we need to ask ourselves are two simple questions. Which patients need it? and under which procedures do they get it? So the, for the first question, which patients need endocarditis prophylactic treatment? Those with pretty bad heart defects, so people like those who have prosthetic valves, previous endocarditis, cardiac transplant recipients with valvulopathy, or unrepaired cyanotic heart disease. I did not mention patients with mitral stenosis or regurges from any heart valve because these patients don't need prophylaxis unless their valves have been replaced. So just remember, if it says there's some person with tricuspid regurge or aortic regurge or whatever, they don't need it unless their valves have been replaced or they had previous endocarditis. Second question, under which procedure do they get it? So it's really just invasive dental work, and by invasive I mean bloody, and respiratory tract surgery. And this makes sense because the strep dance bacteria are part of our normal flora in our oral cavity. So that's where they normally live, and that's why we're at risk of getting subacute endocarditis from them. So we can give amoxicillin for prophylaxis before the procedure, 
but if they're allergic to penicillin, then we can just use clindamycin or any type of macrolides like azithromycin or clarithromycin. So yeah, this is pretty much Streptococcus viridans in a nutshell. And now you know why it's known as the Cocknus monster, because it's composed of Streptococcus bovis, Midas, Mutans, and Sanguis. So yeah, if you have any suggestions on what you'd like to see or any better ways of presenting it, please let me know. And just remember to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching guys. Bye bye.